Hi, I'm Gilbert Strang. Uh, I'm a professor of mathematics at MIT. Uh, this is my third Blossoms. The last one was about quadratics. Okay, I get to tell you about complex numbers. Uh, and of course, it starts with real numbers, like 1 and 7 and square root of 2. Uh, but then will come, second will come imaginary numbers. So start with real, then imaginary, put them together, complex numbers. Okay, let's start real with this uh, equation. I'm thinking you may have seen equations like that before, quadratic equation. And the nice way to solve it is to factor that into two pieces and then you can see to make this piece zero, x equal four gives us, it gives an answer. To make this piece zero, x equal one gives an answer and we have the two solutions. Straightforward because that was, didn't involve complex numbers. Now let's get to an imaginary number. Suppose this was our equation. x squared plus one equals zero or if I put the one on the other side, x squared equal minus one. Well, no real solutions for that. So you could either stop, which is what people did for thousands of years, or invent an imaginary number that solves that equation. So that number is called i, i for imaginary, I guess. So i is just defined to be a number whose square is minus one. So x equal i, i squared equals minus one. That's the, the key to everything. All about complex numbers will flow out of that uh, condition that, that any time we see i squared, we can replace it by the real number minus one. Okay, and this will also have another root, x equal minus i, because of course minus i squared is also minus one, because minus times minus gives plus, that leaves i squared, which gives us the minus one. So, and this thing then would factor into x minus i and x plus i equals zero. What I want to say is all polynomials can be factored, maybe not so simply and easily as this one, but if we allow imaginary and complex numbers, we can still do it. Okay, so this is the starting point. But I, I want to uh, take a more interesting, more exciting equation. Let me get up to fourth power. So can I t t go next to x to the fourth equal one? Okay, degree four, I'm expecting four solutions to that equation. And of course I can write that equation as x to the fourth minus one equals zero. Now what are those four solutions? I'm thinking four solutions because I see it's a degree four equation. Okay, this I see, I could factor that without going imaginary right away into x squared minus one times x squared plus one equals zero. Okay, because that gives me x to the fourth minus x squared plus x squared minus one is there. Okay, now get down to the solutions. So th if this is zero, I have a solution x equal one or x equal minus one. That gives me two solutions because this is degree two. And what about this one? When can that factor be zero? Well, that's the one we did. That's the one that gave us x equal i and x equal minus i. Those are the four. One, two, three, four solutions to this fourth degree equation. That's what we expect. That's what Gauss, the greatest mathematician of all time, proved that every fourth degree equation has four solutions. Every nth degree equation has nth n solutions. These, th these four are nice because, nice to draw. 
So I'm, I want to draw the complex plane. The complex plane has, here's a real number, x equal 1. That's sitting along the real line, the real axis, at 1. The second solution, x equal minus 1, is also real. It's at minus 1. It's here. And the other two, x equal i, is up the imaginary axis. That's the point. We can, we can have real numbers. We can have imaginary numbers. And in a minute, or in four minutes, we're going to have complex numbers. So, but where is this imaginary number? It's right there, right at the top of the circle. And minus i is at the bottom of the circle. I, I put in that circle because it's very important. It gives you a, 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 a sort of a good picture of the complex plane. The plane has zero in it, has small numbers, and has larger numbers. And the, that unit circle, where the numbers are somehow of size one, is the great thing to see. I'll tell you what a complex number is. It has a real part, and it has an imaginary part. Let me, go, let me take the real part one and the imaginary part i. There is 1 plus i. That's 1 plus i. 1 plus i. That's bigger than 1. You notice it's outside the circle. If I want to bring that into the circle, or maybe onto the circle would be nice. So can I put it, can I, I'll draw, let me draw that line, because it's sort of part of the picture. So this one was 1 plus i. This is going to be some smaller number plus some smaller number times i, that point. So let me tell you what that number is. That's 1 plus i divided by the square root of 2, which I have to, have to bring it back. That's a special number. Let me call that z. OK, here, here's a challenge for, during, during the next pause. Let me, let, me, let me write again that number. z is 1 plus i over the square root of 2. What I want you to do is figure out what is z squared. Think you can do that? Figure out how, how could I multiply that by itself, see what I'd get. And then, if you can, look, think about the equation z to the eighth equal 1. Can you, uh, in fact, this z, this, this, this wonderful z, its eighth power will be 1. So that will be, this will be, this number right here, poo, poo, is a solution to the equation z to the eighth equal 1. And we know how many more solutions do we expect? Seven more to make eight altogether. Can you find them? OK, that gives you more than enough to do. Thanks. OK, let me pick up by drawing this complex plane again. And that point z, the particular point uh, that goes along uh, the real distance, 1 over square root of 2, up the imaginary distance, and produces that number z. So that's a typical point in the complex plane. Uh, I'll draw other points, too. What do I want to do with these complex numbers? I want to be able to add them, and I want to be able to multiply them. So that's what that's our first job is. How do, how do I add complex numbers? Let me pick an interesting complex number with, uh, that goes with that one. It's down here. It's sort of the mirror image of that one. It's, so, so let me call that one z bar. That bar tells me it's the mirror image in the real axis. So what is z bar? z bar, that, that point, 
has the same real part, the same 1 over square root of 2, and do you see what happens to the imaginary part? I change the sign. Instead of going up to z, I come down to z bar. So instead of i over the square root of 2, I have minus i over the square root of 2. So those are two complex numbers, rather special ones. That one is the conjugate. Let me write that word, conjugate, or the complex conjugate of z. You just change i to minus i everywhere you see it. OK, so those are two candidates to add and to multiply. Let me do add first. What is, if I add complex numbers, and they happen to be conjugates in this example, how do I add complex numbers? Just what you have to do, you add the real parts. So I add that real part to that real part. So I'll have 2, uh, over two times, times 1 over square root of 2. And I add the imaginary parts. I add that part to that part. And what do I get for that? Those happen to cancel. That's the idea of conjugates. So that number plus its conjugate is a real number. And I could write this as square root of 2. It's the real number. Uh, so th that's the rule for addition. Just do what you have to do. Add the real parts, add the, uh, add the imaginary parts, and you've got it. Multiplication is really the most interesting operation on the complex plane. So uh, let me do a multiplication. Let me multiply these two numbers. It, that's rather special, too. z times z bar. How, how are you going to do that multiplication? You're multiplying that, which has two pieces, times that, which has two pieces. But all you do is multiply every piece on the left by every piece on the right, put them together. So I'll multiply 1 over square root of 2 times 1 over square root of 2. That will give me a half. And then I'll multiply i over the square root of 2 times 1 over the square root of 2. That will give me a plus i over 2, I think. That times that will be an imaginary part. This times this will be also an imaginary part. Oh, it's got, it's got the minus sign now. So it will be a minus i over 2. Two. And then finally, and this is, I'm getting finally to the importance of i, when I multiply that part by that part, I have i times i, which is minus 1. And then there's the minus sign, so I'm plus 1, so I'm real. The i times i produces this real number, which is, I think, a half again. The square root of 2 times the square root of 2 giving me the 2. Here's the point. For, with conjugate numbers, z times z bar, the imaginary parts cancel. And I just have these two parts giving, in this case, 1. So in multiplying, that distance is 1. That distance is 1. And when I multiply, I got the answer 1. That's the idea of com complex conjugates. And it shows you how to add and how to multiply. But now I better take any two numbers and just do the same thing. Here, so here's one of my numbers, a plus bi, any, any a or any b. a is the real part. b is the imaginary part. And here's another complex number. If I add them, what do I get? So if I add a plus bi to c plus di, what could it be but a plus c and bi plus di? So I have a plus c is the real part, and bi plus di. Of course. I just added the two pieces here and the two pieces there separating the real parts and the imaginary parts. Now I'll multiply. I'll multiply those numbers. a plus bi times c plus di. 
OK. So multiplication is the, is the one, the interesting one. Here, let me do it the boring way. A times C. That's real. Where else am I going to get a real part? A times DI, that will be imaginary. I see a real part coming from BI times DI. Do you see that? When that multiplies that, I have B times D, and the I squared is producing a minus B times D. So that's the real part. And now I'm ready for the imaginary part. That'll be a BI times a C. So the imaginary part is going to be an I, something times I. So I have B times C times I, and I have A times D times I. OK. Success. I multiplied two complex numbers. But I don't, don't see anything wonderful about that, and there is something wonderful about it. Let me show you what, what happens when I multiply two complex numbers. So uh, 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 the point is, to do multiplication, I want to get this, these distances involved. That distance I'll call R. This distance I'll call capital R. That's the sort of the, oh, well, you see what R is. R is R squared, well, Pythagoras is a key here. R squared is A squared plus B squared. Let me tell you what's going to happen in multiplication and then show it to you in the next segment. OK, what's going to happen? When I multiply that number times that number, I'm going to get a number whoa, maybe out here. And it'll be, I'll add the angles. That's the key. I'll add that angle to that angle. What do you think? That's about, when I add those, it might be off here. So. This, I think, is that answer. And from that picture, you don't see it. But from this picture, with the r times r is the length of that, and the angle plus the angle gives me this angle. OK, let me just test that on the first one. Can I come back to the first one? When I, when I multiply that z times that z bar, OK, what are the angles here? This z is at some angle, let's say theta, maybe it's 45 degrees. And what's the angle for the complex conjugate? Minus theta, you can see, because it's a mirror image. And what is the angle when I multiply z times z bar? I go to, I'm going to add the angle, so I'm going to add theta and minus theta, zero. So z times z bar has angle zero, and sure enough, z times z bar came out to be one at angle zero. So my rule that I want to develop in the next step is, is multiply r's and add angles. OK, can I leave you with some practice on uh, these operations, addition and multiplication? Let me, let me choose and complex conjugates. So let me take the number minus, minus uh, 1 plus 1 half i. Would you say about there? So that, that'll be a number. Minus 1 plus 1 half i. And I want to ask you, tell me what is z bar, its conjugate? What is z times z bar? What is z plus z bar? Just do everything you can with that complex number, and then we'll come back to the beautiful way to see multiplication. Good, thanks. OK, this is the moment when we multiply the right way. 
using polar coordinates. That means instead of the real part, A, and the imaginary part, B, I'm going to use the distance r and the angle theta. The polar coordinates are r and theta. Let me connect those to A and B. So r then in this right triangle, here's my, here's my A plus bi. I go real part A, imaginary part B. Those are the rectangular coordinates. And now I want the polar coordinates what r and theta, and I want to connect those. Well, it's pure, I've got a triangle here, a right triangle, so it's just trig. A is the hypotenuse times the cosine, right? That's the definition of the cosine of that angle. The A, the, the near side, divided by the hypotenuse. And B, R sine theta. So when I know R and theta, this tells me A and B. Now suppose I know A and B, which is where I start. If I know A and B, what about, then now I want to find the polar coordinates, R and theta. So R is the hypotenuse. And Pythagoras saves us again. R is the square root of A squared plus B squared. So that's the answer for R. And what about that angle theta? Well, I certainly don't have room to write the formula for theta in there. What, what do I know about theta? If, if, if you tell me A and B, I know that the tangent of theta, the tangent of that angle is the opposite side divided by the near side. So tan theta, let me write it here, is B, the opposite side, divided by A, the near side. That tells me the main information about the angle theta. So those are the, those are the great formulas, R and theta, B and A. And now I'm going to write this number A plus BI, that number there, in polar coordinates. So instead of the A and B, I want to use the R cos theta and the R sine theta. So this is R cos theta, that's A, and the i is still there, that tells me go up or down, times r sine theta. Okay. You may say, well, that didn't look any better than a plus bi, but it is. Now, first of all, everybody sees that I have an r in both terms, so I factor out the r, and, that, and then I have cos theta plus i sine theta. So now I'm separating the distance part, the r, which says how far it is, from the angle part, the theta, which gives me the direction. And the distance and the direction tell me where that final point is. Okay, here I'm ready to multiply. I'm ready to multiply that number. Suppose I multiply by itself. Suppose I multiply a plus bi. I want to do square this. I want to multiply a plus bi times a plus bi and see what I get. I'm going to multiply in polar form. So now I'm ready for, let me take away tan theta, which is getting in our way, and, and multiply. So now I'm going to do a plus bi squared, just to show you the beauty of this. Okay, now that's this thing squared. What do I get? I want to multiply that by itself. So I get r 
we'll multiply an r, r from one factor, r from another factor. I'll have r squared, and then this part, cos theta plus i sine theta squared. No problem. And now I'm going to get to the bottom of this part. So what do I have? I have r squared. And now I do you, can I just multiply that out the usual way? Cos squared theta is real. Where else is real? Have you got the idea? When this multiplies itself, it's real with the minus sign. So minus sine squared theta. And now I have the imaginary part, cos theta times sine theta. Very good, I'll put that in, cos theta, sine theta. And another one, right, because I'm squaring. So I have this times itself. So a cos theta will multiply an i sine theta, and an i sine theta will multiply a cos theta. I have two of them. All right. Okay. Uh, so r squared multiplies all that. So can I put a big bracket around? Again, you're going to say, this isn't better, but it is better. OK, so I have one more step, one more step. And it's going to come here. And this is going to be this, the answer. The r squared is always good. What do you see inside those parentheses? What, do you recognize two cos theta, sine theta? I'm asking back to, to trig formulas. That is the same, that i part is the same as, that's the sine of 2 theta. And do you recognize this thing? Cos squared minus sine squared. That's a, that, there's a, the trigonometry for the double angle formula tells me that that is cos 2 theta. Now look at that answer. So this is z squared. I've squared it here. a plus bi squared is what I did. But I did it in polar coordinates r and theta because now I see that the r's multiply and the thetas add. The theta, one theta adds to the other theta to give me two theta. And in general, angles add, numbers multiply. OK, I have one more improvement to make on this multiplication. And it comes from a brilliant formula of Euler. Euler's great formula. It's, it's one of the be most beautiful formulas in all of mathematics. So let's see it here. And it, I'll present it more fully in, after a break. OK. So I want to write this r cos theta. I'm going back to cos theta and i sine theta. That's our complex number, a plus bi. This is the r part. I'm very happy with the r part. But Euler had a great idea for the angle part. He realized that this combination is exactly the same as e to the i theta. The exponential, this is the 2.7 something, but taken to an imaginary power. And, and, and I'll show you why that is correct. And then let me multiply so by itself. So r squared times cos theta 
plus I sine theta squared. That's what I did out with your help through on that. That took time, but let me just square that number. Can you multiply that number by itself? R multiplies R to give the R squared we expect. E to the I theta times E to the I theta is exponents add E to the I two theta. I added E to the I theta to, to E, I added I theta to I theta and got two of them. And that's exactly the right answer. So this is the way to multiply. Multiply distances, add angles. Thanks. So let me leave you with uh, a, a specific example then. Take our favorite number, uh, z, that number we've been calling z, 1 over the square root of 2 plus i over the square root of 2. So you can see a, you can see b. Find r, find theta, and find e to the i theta, and find z squared. So this is our z, that complex number that you know, at the 45 degree angle, that I've helped you. Uh, so it's got an r, it's got a theta, the, the combination cos theta plus i theta is this e to the i theta, and then you can square it. Thank you. OK, I have to say more about Euler's great formula. This is the heart of complex numbers. He was from Switzerland, but he worked in Russia. And he wrote in Latin. And he wrote more math papers than anybody else. And he did great work. So here's the formula that we ended up. The combination of cos theta this part across plus i sine theta is that number. The distance is certainly 1, the magnitude, because cos squared plus sine squared is 1. The hypotenuse is 1. But the, and the angle is theta. And we can express that number, Euler says, as e to the i theta. So what could e to the i theta be? e or e squared or e cubed, that's tricky enough. But here we have a imaginary number, i theta, in the exponent. So let me start with a real x and just remember what is e to the x. That, that, this is the most important uh, function. e to the x is the great function of calculus. It's the function that you can't create in, in just simple algebra with some quadratic or cubic, but we can create it using calculus. and. So let me, I'll give you the calculus part. Calculus is about derivatives. And this function, e to the x, satisfies the amazing equation dy dx equal y. So from the point of view of calculus, the, the key to that function, e to the x, is that it solves that equation. But I want to tell you. Well, I can't do it in algebra, but you'll see where I have to carry algebra to an extreme. Let me, let me tell you what e to the x is. e to the x is, it starts with 1, and I need an x, and I need a 1 half x squared, and I need a 1 sixth. That next one is going to be 1 sixth, but I'm ready to see the pattern here. 6 is 3 times 2 times 1, 3 factorial, x cubed. This was that 2 is really 2 factorial, 2 times 1. This 1 is 1 factorial. That 1 is 0 factorial. 0 factorial is 1, by the way. That's, and I have to keep going. That's why algebra is not enough. I cannot stop. So the next term would be 
1 over 4 factorial 1 24th of x to the fourth and onwards. So can I use the three dots that mathematicians love to say, keep going? And then the typical term is 1 over some n factorial x to the nth and keep going. That's the, those three dots are the key to everything. So that is my construction of e to the x. And now I'm ready for e to the i theta. I just take x to be i theta. So e to the i theta is 1 plus i theta plus 1 half i theta squared and 1 6 and so on. Okay, now I'm ready for Euler. So now we know what one side of the equation is, e to the i theta. The other side, cos theta plus i sine theta, I want to see those. So that's back to trigonometry. Uh, so can I write the formulas for cos theta and sine theta and you'll see that it comes together. Let me go one more term here so you see it. One sixth of i theta cubed and onwards. Okay. Now what Euler is telling me to look at cos theta as the real part. So let me take the real part of this. The real part is the part with no, without the i. So the real part is 1. That's got an i in it. That has an i squared, so that's minus 1 half theta squared. And then onwards. That's the real part. And then the imaginary part, can I do the imaginary part? I have the i and the i cubed. You see that the even powers are going to go in this part. And that part is amazingly cos theta. The odd powers will have an i in them. They go into the imaginary part. So I have the imaginary part is i times theta. And what, how do I have? This is one sixth of i cubed theta cubed. Okay, what's i cubed? What's the i cubed there? i cubed is i squared times i, so that's minus 1 times i. So I just need a minus there. I have an i. Minus is, accounts for i squared, and then the 1 6 theta cubed and onwards. So this is the odd powers. This is the even powers. And the even part gives the cosine. The odd part gives the sine, so let me make this formula all perfect. We're putting the two together, cos theta and i sine theta. Okay, so that's, that's my way of understanding Euler. That's my way of understanding Euler. And let me just ask you, I'll give you a few minutes to do it. What about, could you figure out What is e, if I take e and I plug in x equal i pi over 2, e to the i pi over 2 equals what? Or e to the i pi would be another one. Okay, how, I'm, I'm going to ask you for these numbers. Incredibly, they're simple numbers. They, they, uh, e to the i pi, I'm not expecting you, even though I'll give you a little time, I'm not expecting you to put x equal i pi in there. That, that number is 1 plus i pi plus a half of i pi squared and so on. But infinite series are beautiful to look at, but you don't want to add up all the terms. I want you to think about this as a complex number. The angle is pi. The distance, the magnitude r is, okay, you can do it. You can do it. You can figure out what e to the i pi turns out to be 
and what e to the i pi over 2 turns out to be. And then if somebody is really weird or, or interested, what is i to the i? Oh, that's an amazing number. Okay, thanks. Well, okay, I left you with three questions. Uh, let me make some comments on those and then tell you about a fantastic picture called the Mandelbrot set. Okay, so my questions were, what are those three complex numbers? So, how to do that first one? Okay, Euler said that this is the same as the cosine of pi over two plus i times the sine of pi over two. And those are things that we know. That's 90 degrees. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. And the sine of 90 degrees is one. So I have I. The answer to that question was an amazing number. E to the I pi over two equals I. What about E to the I pi? Okay, if we follow Euler again, that's cosine of pi plus I sine of pi. 180 degrees, the cosine has dropped to minus one. The sine of 180 degrees is zero. And I get minus one. A lot of people think this is a wonderful formula. E to the i pi is minus one. If I put the number i pi into that infinite series and add it up, you won't see it happen, but somehow at the end, the whole thing adds to minus one. And now this was a crazy one for teachers, for professors. What could I to the I be? What sense can I make of it? Let me suggest a way to do it. That I is, according to our first formula, e to the I pi over two. So that I is e to the I pi over two, Thank you, Euler, to the power i. Now, now I've got something I can work with. Do you remember what the rule is for exponents when you take a power? If you took x cubed to the fourth power, that would be 3x's times 3x's times 3x's times 3x's, 12x's, x to the 12th. You multiply the 3 and the 4. Here I multiply those guys. So it's e to the i times i pi over 2, which is minus pi over 2. Look at that. i to the i has come out to be some real number. And uh, I don't actually know what the digits are. You'll find them. Anyway, that's the amazing answer to i to the i. Now for the Mandelbrot set. Can I first ask a question to lead into the Mandelbrot set? Remember the complex plane. Remember the unit circle, the things of size one. Suppose I start with a complex number there. Start with z. Look at z, z squared, z cubed, forever. What do I get in the limit? So I take that number z. The point about that number z is that it's inside the unit circle. What does that mean? It means r is less than 1 in here. Then what about z squared? z squared, the magnitude of z squared, is r squared. The magnitude of z cubed is r cubed. And with r less than 1, those numbers are getting small. My conclusion here is that that goes to 0. Suppose I take instead a number out here. That'll be my second number. Out there, r is bigger than 1. Now I do z, z squared, z cubed, so on. What's happening here? When I multiply that number by itself, the r's will multiply to give r squared. 
the angles will add, so it'll be a number down here, it'll be about there. That'll be r z squared. z cubed will be further out. This will go to infinity. Okay. And points on the circle, now let me take a point on the circle, what happens to those? If, I, if that's my, this is r equal one on the circle. The square of that is on the circle again, at twice the angle. The cube is three times the angle, four times the angle. So I'm running around the circle. I'm running around the circle, or jumping around the circle, when I take powers of that one. All right, now for Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot had a fantastic idea. This Mandelbrot set is going to be a part of the complex plane, uh, it won't look like a circle. It'll, it has a very, very strange shape, which you'll have to see with a blown up picture. What I want to do in the is the math part to tell you where did that Mandelbrot set come from. So you remember uh, with w what we did first, I took a number, I squared it, square that, square that, square that. Mandelbrot had the idea, let the n plus first one, be the square of the nth one. So if he stopped there, we're just taking powers of the original z0. But you're going to add in a constant, say w. That's a, that'll be another complex number. OK. So, and, and I have to start this thing with z0 at w. OK. So here's the question that Mandelbrot asked himself. If W is some complex number, anything in the complex plane, I start Z0 at that number W, then what is Z1? Z1, I take one step, is Z0 squared, that's W squared, plus the W. Okay? That's some other complex number. Maybe bigger, maybe smaller. Z2 will be that number squared, W squared plus W, all squared, plus one more W from there, right? I just keep going in theory. And I ask the question, do these numbers blow up or not? If they don't blow up, I put W, that complex number, in the Mandelbrot set. I put W in the Mandelbrot set. So th let me do an example. Suppose W is a pretty small number. Then I start small. That doesn't add much. That doesn't add much. If W is small, it's going to be in the Mandelbrot set. All right, so let me draw, <laughs> put a W. There's a small W. If W is sort of big, it will be outside the Mandelbrot set. And so the Mandelbrot set is some crazy set with little pieces on, little pieces on, little pieces on, little pieces on those pieces, which contains all the W's, so that if I start with W, go to W squared plus W, go to that squared plus another W, Go to that squared plus another w and keep going. If w is in this set, I don't blow up. So w, the Mandelbrot set is the, all the w's that stay bounded when you do this a little bit crazy iteration on them. Okay, you'll have to see a picture of that. That comes next. Thank you.
Hi. Well, thank you for uh, being part of this uh, complex number uh, presentation uh, and your students. Uh, so I've uh, been teaching at MIT for quite a while. Um, complex numbers come into it. Not everybody knows Euler's formula when they arrive at MIT. Uh, and then uh, my part is more matrices and linear algebra, linear equations. Uh, so that's on open courseware, and uh, but the quadratic uh, blossoms on, quad on the quadratic equation, I hope your students would like that. My objective in uh, this blossom was to open up the idea of complex numbers. It's, it's partly algebra. We, just, we, were multi, we were factoring quadratics. We were multiplying numbers with parentheses. So all that mechanics goes in a new way to, thanks to Euler, into getting complex numbers in there. And then we got as far as the Mandelbrot set at the end. That's really amazing. Uh, but the, the key is to see that complex plane and the unit circle in the complex plane. I think if, you, if your students uh, practice with that, uh, they've got something really valuable, really worthwhile. And I hope you like doing it too. Thank you.